my power supply went out. It took a second to, to get that all back up and running, but I'm happy to be back, happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for, for being a part of it. What's happening? My, uh, my video, everything is delayed a little bit. Sorry, my, my video and audio may be delayed, but I'm here. I'm live with y'all. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. We had such a great community on, on, on Reddit that was part of the last stream. I hope they, they drop in here to hang out with us and continue the conversation. Uh, Cause I shouldn't, <sighs> you know, and I tried to spell constitution correctly. I like had to like retype it over and over again. I still fucking spelt it wrong. <laughs> How uncivilized of me, definitely. So I was sharing a story that was relevant uh, to kind of the this like exhaustion and this confusion and this almost kind of nihilism that you can face as you try to wrap your head around these concepts. Um, you know, even just trying to wrap your head around them, not even talking about the activism piece on it, because once you start dealing in the activism piece, that's a whole other story, um, which you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to speak on as, as uh, you know, someone that is doing activism work in this field. But last night on TikTok, I went down a rabbit hole. There's a little bit of a, a personal friendship that is disintegrating um, on, on the app. And this friendship was two activists to very active activists talking about intersectional feminism, talking about systemic racism, marginalized communities and, and how to, not so much how to uplift the voices of the marginalized communities, but how to acknowledge them, how to know what their their viewpoint is, which is ironic because neither of those uh, people are um, are black, are members of, of this, this specific community that we're talking about, but they represent, they're allies, um, and <clears throat> they're famously on the app, collaborators, good friends, making content together, talking together publicly about these issues, but last night, uh, their friendship had a little bit of a of an explosion and it was kind of a dramatic explosion where uh, people are gossiping and you know this person sent you know the screenshot of their text messages to another person who is then using those to create public content to cancel culture these other people and it's this petty as fuck and it's like where did that come from i thought these like I looked up to these folks as activists. I looked up to them as, as mentors of sorts as I'm on my own activism journey. And fuck activism now, what I'm coming to learn. <laughs> hey Emma, good to see you. I don't know if, if that's the right path for me now. I'm still like, I'm, I'm going through my own cycles of like, does this even matter? Like at the end of the day, I'm just gonna be as petty and, and, and violence as the things that we're trying to call out in our activism, right? Um, and yeah, it, it can be hard. You know, we had somebody on chat. Hey, Airborne. Yeah, so we are doing a constitution study group. By the way, my name is Elise. Welcome to my tea table. It is so good to have you here. On Wednesday afternoons, I come on to the channel and uh, look at different relevant issues pertaining to the Constitution, pertaining to our protocols of civility, of our protocols of politeness with one another. And uh, today I found an article about a new law that is currently being voted upon in the Congress uh, on the federal level 
uh, saying that federal funds would be held back from education institutions that do support uh, education curriculum, such as critical race theory, as well as other things pertaining to uh, mostly uh, the history around systemic racism. Um, and so uh, I, I am currently in the middle of reviewing an academic article from 1996 laying out the premise of critical race theory and how constitutionalism as affecting that. And essentially, it's um, it's a majority against a minority, and you know when the majority controls the rhetoric, controls the narrative, it, it's 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 very difficult for the minority perspective um, to voice their experience. And now. So yeah, it was CRT, and we're talking about CRT. Do I support it? Uh, I support the, the the discourse that it's bringing out right now. You know, I'm I'm learning, so I can't even have my own position on the framework itself. Hopefully, by the end of today's stream, I will have a better grasp on it. But what I do appreciate out of CRT is that it's bringing forward a very productive discourse um, and, and, and making it very glaringly obvious that there are very different perspectives involving systemic racism and, and racism in general within our culture. And that's what I support about it. You know, and that I'm here now and we're talking about it and, and you're engaging with it. I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Now, I do drink tea while I have these conversations because sometimes these conversations can get a little, a little tricky, a little deep, uh, a little sensitive. Um, and uh, nothing better than tea to help focus the mind, loosen, relax the body as uh, we do approach these uncomfortable conversations. How do I feel about you being black? It's great. I mean, I would love to hear your opinion and support on the current, not only the current discourse around CRT, but damn, your voice needs to be heard. Please, so much. Share your voice. Okay. Sorry. Let me uh, let me go back up. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're back, oh, um, thank you so much for coming back. Oh, I see, I see uh, Airborne, I see, uh, I see your comment now. <laughs> oh, you're asking about my variety of tomato? It's not a tomato, actually, this is a uh, this is a persimmon. It's a persimmon. I got two of them. I also have bacon. I love bacon. I love bacon. <laughs> yeah, so uh, your story about the amusement park, um, it's unfortunate that that happened. But it, it, it has nothing, I mean, it, it's, it does have something to do with systemic racism, duh. But it's not, it's not racism. It's interesting how there's there's a certain rhetoric that you you hear over and over again. Yeah, I don't think CRT implies anything that being white is racist by default. If anything, 
CRT is teaching you that all people are racist by default, not just white people. <laughs> yeah, I, I do, Dank. That <laughs> Dank FOMA, that's a good name. Um, I do actually, you know, so that's another reason I, I opened up this stream sharing a story about how futile activism can feel sometimes, especially in this topic, because you hear stories about like, why am I trying to fight this whenever I in it myself, I have it ingrained in who I am. I'm making the same mistakes that I'm calling others out on, you know, that it can, it can start to feel quite exhausting and futile to be dealing in them. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're investing all this time, which we need to, and I'm not jaded on that. I will continue to invest my time and, and, and to helping my neighbors have stronger lives. Like that's, that's just, that's just me. That's what I want to do and feel called to do. But, you know, we could talk all day long about this, but like with what's going on with the environment and our habitat, I mean, that's, that's going to do much more damage. But you know what? The CRT is the foundation of that problem, right? Consumerism, commodification, those are what's causing like the the drastic environmental destruction that we're currently in what supported that crt thank you army guy are you gonna homeschool your kids i hope you have a great time teaching your kids i think people should teach their kids i want to homeschool my kids i don't have any kids i want kids I hope I get to do that. Thanks for all the airtime, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, we can make the case. And so that's why this is not just an American problem. It's, a, it's an international issue to be addressed. And I mean, that's the first step is just addressing it. And that's what like this whole conversation around CRT is simply just asking people to address it. I think that there could be a lot more power in, in injected into this movement if we are reminded that, that everybody is affected, negatively affected by this issue. You know, certainly being white does afford you privileges within the system that we're talking about. But ultimately, we all end up losing out because of what we were just talking about, the environmental destruction, like our habitat, our ability to live here is, 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 is done anyway. Thank you for that, 6-6. Six, six. Yeah. All right, so the, the, so 666 six, six proposes. So this is how we address it. Next time you see a black guy, treat him like a guy, not a black guy. Um, So we tried that, right? My, my woke hippie friends, a lot of them, when we try to talk about these things, they say, I don't see color. You know, when I walk up, I was raised, you know, when I walk up to somebody, I don't see their skin color and I just, and the existence of the systemic issues makes that action like an evading action which is problematic. So, you know, not to say that 
by addressing it, we have to say, I address it and I support it. To say, I address it and I don't support it. And you may feel that, that that's like a futile thing to say, like no result will happen just by purely saying that, but manifestation works in a beautiful way. Again, um, you know, this is brought up a lot about Marx. Um, you know, like, uh, I'm very happy to have a conversation about the flaws in Marx uh, ideology and, and writing, but I don't know, I've, I've, I've written it, or I've read it a couple of times, and I don't know, I mean, Marx 101, I, Marx is a 101, I, I'm okay with that. Calling things problematic and problematic, great. <laughs> yeah. This is a learned victimhood. That's what you called it. I mean, what about the lived experience? I think that's different, different than, than this learned victimhood. Because there are lived experiences, not just one case, it's not just one story, it wasn't just one police shooting. And not all of them are black and white like that. It's not all like, oh, it's only police brutality and like there's subtle things in there too. You know, I was, I was in a romantic relationship with a black man and uh, my, you know, like there was issues, not from me, but from my family and issues that I never thought would have exist, could have existed and they freaking existed and they were blaring and They were subtle. I mean, the, the, the man I'm talking about was not like physically harmed from the experience. And uh, to be honest, he was used to it. And that's what made me sad. Was like, it wasn't, it was just like, oh, that's just a Tuesday afternoon for me. I'm like, fuck, man. It's like immediately from the time someone meets you, they already have a judgment about you. Like, that's what happened with him. And I was like, how the heck? And the second that you try to address it, you know, oh, it's this learned victimhood, you know? I like baby steps. You know what's cool about baby steps, army guy, is that like in baby steps, you can evaluate your situation after each baby step. So please do not, uh, do not, uh, what was the word they were using? Radical, radicalize what we're talking about here. The sin of capitalism is greed. The sin of socialism is laziness and entitlement. Wow. You know what I do support? I support, um, and this is gonna, this is gonna, this is gonna get you all riled up. I know. I support um, matriarchal societies. That's what I support. I support it, and let's talk about it. I'm happy to talk about that. If you have strong opinions about that, please bring them in. Yeah, I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying you're radicalizing what I just what I just said. (laughs) 
Six six six. You trying to you trying to stir some shit up? Huh. Okay. So there's another hot take. Consciousness creates reality. I you know I'll hold space for it. I'm like, I'm like one of those old school philosophers that's like really into, um, you know, math and, and things lining up. It's like, I believe, I believe that math can exist without people, without a human consciousness. Hey, so Pinky, you said that your wife uh, implanted a matriarchal society in your home. How's that going? <laughs> um. So with matriarchal society, what I want to say about that, because I, I had a conversation about it with some, you know, very smart dudes, um, some very smart, like, philosophy, sociology, PhDs that do work with, like, big data and, and AI and, you know, analyzing the sentiment, community sentiment and whatnot with, uh, with Twitter data and other data, Reddit data inclusive, yeah. Anyway, um, I was talking with them about societies. We were streaming to Reddit and somebody asked him the questions, what is the most ideal society? If everything is so problematic and creating, and, and I just like kind of cut them off and was like, well, what about matriarchal societies? What do you guys say about that? Cause like, I've heard good reviews. There's not a whole lot of evidence, uh, but I've heard good reviews and, um, She's making me say it's going great. <laughs> um, so these the, these dudes they described to me in great detail the the history and I should say prehistory or, or antiquity of matriarchal societies because it's it's a lot from like long history. But the way that they were describing these societies it's not like the women are in charge like men will still be in charge like they're both it's it's almost like an egalitarian society so i think it's like it's kind of misogynistic to even call that type of society a matriarchal society it was just an, an egalitarian society where both men and women held positions of power within the family within the community within the governing operations um, you know, because the, the term matriarchal society makes it seem as if women are in charge. And, um, and then it can kind of scare people and it radicalizes it. It's like a matriarchal, matriarchal society is not a radical society. Like it's a freaking equal society. You know, everybody has value. And with that said, thank you so much for being here and for, for holding space for me um, to, 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 to speak these things. I know a lot of it doesn't really make sense and I don't know what I'm talking about, um, but it's powerful just to have this, this discourse. Yeah, every village should make their own rules. You're right, every family should make their own rules. All right, I'm looking that up, 666. Thank you so much for contributing your, uh, your ideas and, and ideas to it your thoughts and ideas to the conversation today. A universal pantheist society. I'm gonna see, this is new for me. I like learning new things. That's why I invite all of y'all to my tea table so y'all can teach me, y'all can teach me all these cool things. All right, let's see.
The Universal Pantheist Society is one of the world's first official organizations dedicated to the promotion and understanding of modern Pantheism. Pantheism. We seek renewed reverence for the earth and a vision of nature as the ultimate context for human existence. I like that. All right, pure woman, I'm gonna get into that. Woman peer of spirit who find mutual partnership with a man, I would follow that, you bet. Oh, that's good. So Pinky, I'm guessing that you have that, that kind of relationship with your wife, that's great. You are lucky. Not a, uh, what's the term? The, um, the internalized misogyny term. Pick me, not pick me. <laughs> Pick me, girl. <laughs> Everyone should just do acid and have a long, hard look at themselves. You're right. <laughs> I don't know what's on my chin. Maybe my second chin? Maybe. I got a couple chins down there. It is what it is. Thanks for, thanks for letting me know about it, Quirky. Pantheism, pantheism. This is, this is new for me. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look into that a little bit more. General spirit of pantheism. The belief that reality is identical with divinity or that all things compose of all encompassing imminent God. Patheist belief does not recognize a distinct personal God, anthropomorphic or otherwise, but instead characterizes a broad range of doctrines, differing in forms of relationships between reality and divinity. So you know what I think? Uh, kind of straddles reality and divinity is string theory. <laughs> Thank you, oh my guy. Oh, you'd be zero without your wife. That's great of you to, to recognize that. Pinky, how long have you been married? And again, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. I, you know, this is powerful. Like of all this shit that I'm talking about right now, like, again, I, I'm not assigning any kind of value. I'm just like creating this platform with it, but like, that right here, like you sharing your experience of love, of pure love, being the opposite of fear, is just like, that's the value. That's where it's at. Seventeen years, congratulations, aww. I'll be honest, I've never experienced that. And good question, 666. Uh, how did you, how did you know uh, that, that that was the right one? Thank you for asking that. We can learn a lot, you know, just like, just by like trying to understand love through people's own stories could teach us a lot about these topics we're talking about, you know, so I'm holding space for it. Um, yeah, I've never experienced that before and I'm sure others in chat can relate with not experiencing it. And no, nothing wrong with it, it's valid. It's valid to both have experienced it or not experienced it. I just, I haven't had that pleasure. 
But... <laughs> irony. It's so fucking ironic, right? So, like, I, I mentioned about, like, that internalized misogyny that happens among women. They call it being a pick-me girl. If you don't know that term... I mean, we fucking have to go to... Urban Dictionary to look this one up. to go to the Urban Dictionary for this. How sad is this? A girl who goes out of their way to impress boys and make them seem that they're not like the other girls, kind of like a simp, but for girls, otherwise known as internalized misogyny, right? Thank you, Urban Dictionary. This is Urban Dictionary I read it from. Thank you for that education. So, why is it relevant to what I'm talking about right now? And why I'm single and never experienced that level of pure love is because up until a few years ago, I was this. I, I was internalized misogyny. Sure, I was conscious. Sure, I've traveled around the world. Sure, I've seen other people's uh, perspectives and had empathy. But ultimately, I was still playing in this fucking game of like, Oh, I'm not like the other girls. And you're like, all at the end of the day, like, even if I was manifesting myself as a tomboy or whatever, like at the end of the day, ultimately what I was trying to do was to, to, to be on the favorable side of, of men. And then that fucking backfired. So here's the irony, that backfired because in that whole process of trying to be different than the other girls, I built walls around me. Yeah. Very personal. Y'all y'all getting y'all getting personal from me tonight. It's okay. I don't mind. So the nuclear family. CRT is an expansion on Marxism, but applies to race instead of class. Again, I'm kind of cool with Marx, you know, and I accept, I accept all the opinions and all the things, you know, to counter, you know, my, my enthusiasm for, for some of the things that Marx had to say. I take it. Right, but someone said something important, 666. I'd like to make a point that the women that, uh, that put into the mainstream culture narrative often use pick me girls as a put down for people that don't just unitarily accept third wave feminism and modern neoliberal uh, philosophy. Yeah, I'm not using, I'm fucking called, I called myself a pick me girl. <laughs> so it's different, like, and I'm not trying to put myself down. That's it either. Like, I'm not ashamed with how I grew up. I fucking grew up and did the best that I could. I did. You know, like, fuck. But you know what it did? It got me, it got me in a place where it was hard for me to connect with people. It was hard for me to experience love. And that's okay, too. Like, I'm not regretting anything that's happened. The only thing I can regret is how I move forward and the viewpoints I have and the love, the, the infinite amount of love that I do find a path in, in expressing and experiencing. Am I cool with Mal? I'm not cool with Mal. Marx and Mao are completely, completely different. Yeah. See, and there it is. There's a conflict too. The, the hypocrisy. That's something I deal with. That's why I leave myself so open. Because like I I I, I do have strong opinions and based upon experiences, but then at the same time, I'm within this system, right? So it's kind of like, if you're gonna talk about CRT, you also have to 
assume your own responsibility in it. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna talk about the current patriarch patriarchy, then I also need to talk about my own internalized misogyny, which is why I just did the most embarrassing thing that a that a, a woman on the internet could do, and I called myself a pick me girl. Come on. <laughs> I'm also pro-capitalism, and capitalism led to commodification. And I hate commodification. So that, that's like, that's the, uh, the radicalization I'm talking about, right? There's like underlying philosophies that associate with different things. And, you know, just because our current manifestation of capitalism is freaking exploitive and terrible and opaque and just full of corruption doesn't mean that capitalism at its source is still not a great thing. Capitalism is incredible. I'm very pro-capitalist. Meta-validation. I am drinking. Thank you for asking, dude. I am drinking a uh, floral lap song. Lap song. Actually, I need to decant this. Lap song Tushang. You might know that it's like the smoky black tea. No, I'm not. I'm not looking for any validation here. I'm just trying to process. I'm just trying to process some thoughts, and I brought this up, and you know, it's 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 got some good traction here in chat. I'm not trying to validate shit. I mean, the only thing I would be validating is that misogyny is real and that it's, it's, it's deep. And it's not just the men that are responsible for its existence and its proliferation. Yeah. So this is a floral lap song. So the traditional lap song from Fuji in China is actually not smoked. The smoked lap song that you know from 007, from James Bond, uh, that is a Western colonized version of the traditional lap song Shushang, uh, where liquid smoke is added to it. Uh, there are some naturally smoked lap songs that you can find from China, but um, this is the traditional one. So this is a fruity one. I also have a floral one. Um, and that has a lot more to do with the oxidation and the processing that gets you to those different levels of, of fruitiness or floweriness. This one's fruity. It's got like a deep kind of like plum or um, date flavor to it, sweetness to it. A little malty. Bye, Airborne. Are you leaving Airborne? Pinky's leaving? We are all good. We are all love. I mean, that's it. Oh, you love whiskey? Hey, so, hey, dude, if you like black tea and whiskey, um, yeah, you're right. Hey, 666, you're totally right for calling that out. That's why I fucking talk about these topics because we have to talk about them and address them and like rid ourselves of any kind of internalized shit going on that has been imposed on us because we grew up in these systems. So yes, cultural appropriation exists in tea, racism exists in tea, colonization exists in tea, slavery still exists in tea. And if you don't want to support it, you've got you've to gotta have these conversations. But yeah, dude, if you like black tea and you like whiskey, I recommend, I mean, you can mix the two into a cocktail and it like will be good, trust me. But. The other method that's really fun to do with whiskey and tea is you take a sip of the tea and then you take a sip of the whiskey and then you take a sip of the tea again, like all in one go, just like little sips. Uh, and it's called sandwiching and it creates such a cool sensory uh, experience where when, when it comes to drinking the whiskey, you're only gonna get like the refined nuances from the whiskey and none of the like if there is any kind of harshness or whatever, the tea completely masks all of that. It's really great.
James Bond always took cold showers. I did not know that. Did you take a shower with him? Is that is that how that happened? That's cool, Freeze. I get it. Freeze like a statue. Yeah, you're. Are you into cold showers too? <laughs> oh, Pinky, you're leaving. Thank you, Pinky. I appreciate your right to engage with someone's opinion. And anyway, tonight I'm not really sharing too many opinions. You know what I think is pretty powerful to normalize in, the, in these conversations about decolonization and all of this is normalizing poverty. And th that goes to the idea of classism as well. It's like, what is the basis of classism? Wealth, be it generational or new wealth, it's wealth. That's what affects your, 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 your class status. And a lot of that is very common with, you know, with, with CRT issues that are brought up. Is what's wrong with, with being poor? You know, I saw a video, a speech, and it looked like an old speech. It looked like it was from like the 50s or the 60s. And someone was saying like third world countries are not poor. Like the people are poor, but that's just an effect of, of these problems, of these like systemic issues that we're talking about today. But the country itself is abundantly resourceful, abundantly freaking giving, obviously. If there's someone there trying to, to take something from it, be it a natural resource or labor or any of those things, obviously value there. So I say normalize poverty, you know, like, cause I work, I work with rural farmers. That's my job. I run a B2B marketplace that facilitates trade between independent tea growers and tea business buyers. So I liaison the business, uh, the, the trust transactions, the information exchange between these folks. And I travel to meet with all of the tea growers every spring. And so I've developed very strong family-like relationships with all of these growers. And we talk about these things and like the pandemic has just made it even more obvious is that, uh, you know, this whole pandemic, it's like, a lot of these tea farms like shut down during the shutdowns, they shut down. And so people were not working, people were not making money. And everybody's always arguing, oh, we gotta support these jobs. You know, like I know they're only making $2 a day, but we still have to support their job because their liveliness is dependent upon that income. And then the pandemic comes and all of a sudden they're making no money. And at first everybody's like, oh no, they're not gonna be making any money, how? And you know what? They got along just fine. Like, if they have the resources available to them, which a lot of these third world backwards countries, they do. They have soil. They have all their compost that they've been processing themselves. They have indigenous knowledge about how to do, do these things. And then here in the United States, you know, there's some issues. Right? Like we're, we're struggling. The, the country is having to constantly financially support these problems. And now we have an issue of shortage coming on. And it's no secret now. You know, a couple months ago when I first started talking about this, it was a secret and everybody was, oh, so shocked and surprised. But like there's major backup of our sea shipment, container shipping, cargo ships, things backed up for a year plus. And so we're gonna start seeing shortages and extreme inflation on things that like we usually take for granted, such as black pepper. I, I just like to use that as an example, but black pepper is an example of that. All of a sudden, that bottle of black pepper that you're used to paying $5 for, you know, may cost $50. And it may, push us to a place where we have to figure out how to localize our shit, grow it ourselves. We don't have that freaking inherent knowledge there. 
<laughs> you know, dude, okay, you can be broke. I'm broke too. Not looking for step validation. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm your typical broke millennial. Um, and I'm fine with it. So that's what I want to suggest. If you identify with being broke, that is perfectly fine. Do not allow that to create a chip on your shoulder. Do not allow that to become a chip on your shoulder. And that's what I'm trying to say. Normalizing poverty. You know, because a lot of the like internalized colonization, because you wonder, it's like, oh, only white man is the colonizer. What about, you know, you go to places like India where they, the you know, the business people are Indian, the workers are Indian, all the people are Indian, and like there's commodification and, and bad capitalism happening there, and they're not like, you know, white colonizer. It's internalized colonization. It's internalized, right? And and the reason why it's been internalized is because everybody's got this chip on their shoulder that their humanness is connected with how much money they have or how many how much property they have. And that's one cool thing that Marx fucking talked about. So when you when you say that like, oh Marxism, communism, Maoism come in here, it's like no. Like this, this issue around classism, like, why does it even exist in the first place? Like, why do we even allow it to exist? Because, right, they say only, like, 1% has all the power, then us, 99% of us are supporting that. It's like, 99%, like, we're powerful. Why the fuck are we not stopping this from happening? Because we're internalizing it ourselves and, like, allowing it to happen. And I think that's the same conversation that's going on around CRT. <laughs> good good dude <laughs> don't don't let that chip get because that's what makes you a fucking asshole when you start getting this chip on your shoulder that like oh i need to i need to make more money i need to have this and then you die you die living a good life you know, you feel good about the life you live full life 80 years old and you got you got like two million dollars in assets okay you know what I mean? Like, and, 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 and perhaps you made some, you may have made not any direct. England totally decolonized India. Yeah, but England's not there anymore. For the past 70 years, they haven't been there anymore. So why, why is India still behaving that way? It's internalized. Same thing in Africa. And I've lived in Africa. I did the Peace Corps in Africa. And so like, that was like my first experience of like being questioning like, why are, are these folks who in some senses have solidarity with each other in other senses kind of screw each other. It's like, what, why? And it's a lot of, same thing why women fucking don't support each other. It's internalized misogyny. The pick me girls, the pick me girls are like, oh, I'm not like her. I'm better than her. I'm gonna hang out with the boys cause I'm, you know, I'm not like the girls. I can't have relationships with girls cause they're too much drama. And I hang out with the guys. I did that shit. And it, 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 it hurt me in the end because I didn't have any strong female friends. Now I'm starting to, and it feels really good. I'm very happy about that. So supporting your family and giving them a good life is not inherently connected with, like you can do that while in a state of poverty. Maybe not here in this country. And so that's like the systemic things that we can address here. But like, let's say Nepal. Nepal is a great, I, I always like to use as an example. It's like my favorite place to travel to. Um, yeah, it's a great place. So Nepal has very challenged infrastructure. It was not colonized by the British. It did not become a part of India. And that affected its infrastructure. Some say that it's affected them negatively because, oh, we're more poor. You know, like there's, there's parts of, of India and Nepal where they border each other where you can just like walk two steps and you're in the other country. They're both tea growing regions, right? So that's why I have experience there. I travel there to do work. When you're on the Indian side, the roads are nice or nicer. 
there's infrastructure, there, there's bank ATMs everywhere. You can get cash anytime you need it. There, there's infrastructure to support you. You go to the Nepal side, the roads are not as good. It's very difficult to do business there. Uh, cell phone is very challenging and expensive. Uh, internet is, is a difficult infrastructure. It's challenging, right? Um, but then what I say is like, but in, in Nepal, people are a lot more autonomous and they have this beautiful pristine land that they know exactly what they're doing with it. Like they, they have their seeds, they have everything they need. They don't have the money. They don't have those development infrastructures. So that's it. And I'm, I'm not saying this to shame because here I am on the fucking internet using technology to have this conversation with you. So, you know, I'm not trying to shame where we've evolved to in the infrastructures that we do enjoy, but I, I think assigning value and validation to this more simplistic, what used to be called savage, and that just pisses me off. Cause it's like, here we are, we're talking about civility. Like that's what today's talks, the uh, Constitution Study Group is all about civility. Opposite of civil, civilized, savage. So civil is a capacity for politeness. So what does savage mean? It means impolite, unpolite. That's essentially all savage means, you know, but like, this chip on our shoulders as, as, as consumers within the modern or the conventional capitalist system has put this chip on our shoulder that savage, you know, means something um, unrefined or, no, it just simply means uh, unpolite, you know? So someone that's being a dick to you is actually more savage than the person that is still living in a tribe, a tribe like an untouched tribe somewhere in an inaccessible part of the world that, you know, is just waving hi to you. You know, that's more civilized. Someone like greedy, these sins of, of corporate greed that were brought up. I'm looking up the, the famine that you told me to look up. It's a big one. It was caused by an intense drought. Sorry, I, it's a lot to... Thank you for the party train. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. I'm gonna go back to this famine. Why was it relevant, um, army army guy? Like, why, why, why did you want me to look it up? I'm looking it up. I'm trying to understand why it's relevant. Yeah. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate that. I I I I know that you you don't agree with me. I know it's okay. But you know what matters is that you're still here. So thank you, thank you. And you you actually like supported me earlier. I saw that. Thank you. Thank you also for that. Appreciate it. But I'm gonna go back to this famine. I want to know like. I love this part of history, of, of Indian history. That was actually like my first kind of dabble into, yeah, what was that, baby step. It was my first baby step towards Marxism because prior to that, like, I was also, um, you know, very afraid of Marxism and, and everything that it represented. Uh, I, was, uh, I was actually a very big fan of Ayn Rand. I was a young girl. <laughs> 
intelligent young girl. That that's all I that's that's all I could um, wrap my head around and get excited about. Um, but I took an Indian history class when I was 22 years old. I was you know my final semester at my undergrad, and uh, it was about this period of time. It was about the colonization time up until independence. And I was fascinating, and that's where I got introduced to a lot of the ideologies around self-sufficiency, around autonomy, independence. Um, but definitely had not fully articulated the uh, sustaining effect that that colonialism had not only on India but on. Um, on the whole world. Oh, thank you. You're fun too, dude. Cheers. The timing on my cameras is totally off. I need to like reset everything. Did I lose army guy? Oh, I see. Look at the regular export. So we're talking about this great famine that happened due to a drought. So this is like a natural cause. I'm doing really well, Apple. Thank you for being here. Oh, puppy. Oh, it's Apple. Yeah, Apple, thanks for being here. Uh, so the famine or the, the, the crop insecurity happened for um, natural reasons, right? There was a drought. This is during colonialization time, like when the British were there. This was in the late 19th century. The regular export of grain by the colonial government continued. During the famine, the Viceroy, Lord Robert bulwer Lytton, oversaw the export of England to England of a record 6.4 million hundredweights, or 320,000 tons of wheat, which made the region more vulnerable. So like, fuck that. I don't know why you wanted me to look this up, but I'm looking it up and I'm just like getting more angry about it. <laughs> it's like, oh, y'all, y'all are dealing with a famine. Let us just take this uh, limited wheat that you have off of your hands. The, the cultivation of alternative cash crops, which probably included tea, I'm sure. Tea was a major cash crop during that time. I mean, the whole freaking opium wars, all of that was because of tea. And the solution the British had uh, was just for them to go develop their own tea industry and the places that they had colonized. In addition to the commodification of grain played a significant role in the events. So another reason to hate commodification. The famine occurred at a time when the colonial government was attempting to reduce expenses on welfare. Earlier in the Bihar famine, which Bihar, man, they're still suffering a lot. That's, I like that place, it's a nice place. They, they say that that's actually uh, where um, Siddhartha or Buddha did his, uh, his meditation. Severe mortality had been avoided by importing rice from Burma. The government of Bengal and its lieutenant governor, Sir Richard Temple, were criticized for excessive expenditure on charitable relief. Sensitive to any renewed accusation of excess in 1876, Temple, who was now famine commissioner for the government of India, no oh man, that's a job, famine commissioner, insisted not only on policy of laissez-faire with respect to the trade in grain, but also on stricter standards of qualification for relief and on more meager relief rations. Boo. Hey dude, thank you for that. <laughs> I'll drink to that, thank you. But yeah, my voice is off from the video. So I've gotta, I think what I should do is just like reset the whole camera and do it all again. I mean, I could come into this camera and then you can hear, is my voice on with the bottom camera now? Is it? Yep. Yeah. So this camera, this bottom camera is working fine. <laughs> Aw, you really do like whiskey, huh, dude? <laughs> Oh, 
I'll do that on Friday, dude. Today is Wednesday. This is Constitution Study Group. Yeah, the famine's not good. <laughs> yeah, I got multiple cameras. I, I have multiple, multiple cameras. I, I do streaming out of this studio. I've been doing it out of this studio for the past few years, so. And I had all the cameras because my brother, he's a filmmaker. We, uh, we travel to all of the tea growing regions to make videos about the tea and the people behind the tea. And they all just like been collecting dust in the storage closet over the past several years. And so it's been kind of cool pulling all of the studio gear out and setting it up with the live stream. So yeah, I've got lots of cameras working with a green screen. Um, yeah, and I do IRL streaming too, and those are really fun. So that's when I travel. And in fact, next month, if all things work and we can remain civilized with each other, uh, I uh, will be traveling to Europe and I'll be doing IRL streaming uh, while I'm on the road. I don't know how much streaming I'll be doing from Reddit on that because uh, the OBS is separate. I don't know, I'll have to figure it out. I might be able to figure it out. No, he didn't work on the new Sopranos movie. <laughs> Is there a Sopranos movie? I heard there was gonna be something, like a prequel or something like that, with that with that franchise. I don't know. I, I I never actually watched the actual show when it when it was when it was popular. If you like gangster gangster media, let me look it up. Army guy, I don't know why you told me to look up this famine. It just made me more fired up and like further fueled <laughs> my like hatred towards commodification. All right, let me look it up. Um, Jagame Tanhiram. That's what the movie is called. I'm gonna put it in the chat. I highly recommend you check out this movie. It is on Netflix, so it is accessible. I'm sure you can find it on other streaming or you know, whatever networks you uh, stream your media from. It is an Indian movie, um, although a lot of the movie is set in the UK, and there is a lot of English. There's crossover of a lot of English in um, um, Tamil language from South India. So yeah, army guy's kind of gone. So it's a really good movie and I recommend it. If you like gangster movies, if, like things like Sopranos, you, like that kind of gangster, um, the, 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 the main character in this movie, there's subtitles, yes. But there's a lot of English too, so don't like, don't be worried that you're going to constantly have to be reading subtitles the whole time. Like there's English and subtitles, but, uh, the main character is just this like natural born gangster, uh, from South India that is recruited, uh, to help with some relations with South Indians, uh, in, in London. Uh, and so he goes to London. So a lot of the movie is set, you know, once he's there in, in London, um, and it's just incredible. You got a guy to read it for you. I mean, I'm sure you can just turn the dubbing on, but you know, that does compromise <laughs> the, the quality of the, uh, of the experience, but you know, your own, your own perspective, your own, your own liking on it. But I do recommend the movie. It's great. It's probably like the best, the best movie I've watched in a while. And like, I've watched it, I watched it like a month and a half ago and I'm still like thinking about it. There's a lot of really powerful um, themes in the movie, similar to what we're talking about today. Um, around classism, around racism, around um, 
dominance, majority, majority perspective that overpowers the minority perspective. Um, and I know these are all social constructs, but they're valid. Even social constructs are valid. Like if we don't want it to be a social construct anymore, we have to deconstruct it. We cannot just say, oh, oh, I'm so happy. Thank you, dude. Thank you, dude. Thank you for wishing my happiness. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. You know why I'm happy? It's like no specific reason. I mean, I've got a million things to be happy about, but I'm happy because of my autonomy, you know, and, and it could be better. And I'm, I'm working to increase my autonomy and it doesn't, I say autonomy not to indicate independence, right? Because I do believe in interconnectedness and, and value, not only believe it, but fucking value interconnectedness and friendships and relationships. So, you know, I, I, I kind of like hesitate from using the word independent um, in talking about this, but autonomy, where I can make my own decisions and w work on my own terms uh, on the things that I'm passionate about you know, without consequence. Um, not everybody has that privilege. And yes, I have worked hard for that privilege, but it's, 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 I identify it as that. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful, I'm happy. Uh, I, you know, maybe not this morning, I had to wake up to an alarm this morning, but most mornings I don't wake up to an alarm. That brings me a lot of happiness. <laughs> I sleep eight hours every night. I get to um, practice, you know, my fitness when I want to. And I get to contribute the value to the world that I want to, such as creating, you know, this kind of content. I'm functioning at a high level, thanks dude. I don't know, I'm not that smart. You know what I am though? Like, I'm, um, I'm vulnerable. And there's a lot of value in vulnerability. It's interesting how people can interpret vulnerability to intelligence and maybe, yes, maybe there is, especially like emotional intelligence and vulnerability, I think like very much the same. Duck dance, how does the duck dance? Oh, I got ducks, hold on. Let me get my ducks out. Let's see if I still have my ducks here. I used to keep ducks. I might've got rid of them. Oh no, I got them. Oh, I don't have ducks here for you. Oh no, my camera's really delayed. Ah, oh, boo. I think it's my computer, actually. What do you love? Time to help people come. Crab rave. <laughs> protect yourself from that one. Oh my goodness. 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 Duck dance. <laughs> oh man, that's a duck shuffle.
myself hanging out with all these ducks. <laughs> it's Windows, you think so? I gotta get, I don't have Windows. So I'm working on a Mac. Oh, look at these ducks. And they're playing the fucking game. They're good at it too. <laughs> oh man. You know what? Like we're off topic and I totally abandoned the article that I wanted to look at today. Oh, this is a cutie. Oh. Big crab. It's a big one. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> All right, what's going on? Oh, that's because I, I paused the video. We're at the crab rave now. <laughs> yeah, we, we got pretty heavy there. Unfortunately, our good friend um, Army Guy left. Uh, he had a lot to contribute to today's conversation. <laughs> These crowds are getting down. <laughs> hmm. I should go, though. I'm gonna go get some exercise. Go have a little crab rave. <laughs> oh man. But thank you so much for, for being here with me, hanging out. Thank you for the gifts. I got another crab rave? Wow. I've never received so many gifts in, the, in, in a single stream before. Thank you, dude. Hey, dude. Uh, follow me. Let's stay connected. And actually, uh, if you want to see the tea that I'm drinking and what I'm talking about, if you want to find some interesting black teas that you can pair with your whiskeys, check out my uh, my retail website. Just put it there, teaandispeople.com. Booga, 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 booga. That crap, he dances so funny. All right, I'm not raiding anybody because no one here. Reddit, thank you for the love. You always, you're always giving so much love. My tea is all, is all fully brewed. I'm ready to go. Oh, thank you, dude. I appreciate you. You know, I appreciate all the gifts. You got us here. You got us here at the crab raid. <laughs> but uh, I'll see you. Oh, tea sleuth. Yeah, you're a little late. I was just about to sign out. <laughs> I was just about to sign out. Um, yeah, it looks like everything is frozen. We had a pretty heated conversation. I'll, I'll catch you up offline, Eric. But yeah, my uh, I've got to like reboot my, reboot my whole system because everything is delayed like uh, my my uh, video and my audio are, are not in sync and that is problematic and saying that is problematic is problematic as i've learned today which you know is cool i accept it 
Oh, Yonce is is live. We can go say hi to Yonce. I like his music. Oh, No Fire? Spider Show? Oh, he's playing he's playing that one game. Oh, Tea Friends, she just started. No, I'm just gonna go. Eric, you should go hang out with Tea Friends. I'm not gonna raid her, but you can just go hang out with her tomorrow. Yeah, I'll catch you up tomorrow. I'll, yeah, at Tea Talks. Tea Talks Thursday, you know, Tea Talks. Oh, you'll drink that. Another gift. Thank you so much, dude. Much love to you. All right, I'm going to sign out. I've got to go. I really got to go. I love you all. Thank you so much for the great conversation today. Have a great night.